Would you look, uh, please, at Romans 6 and verse 17? Romans 6 and 17. And that's the verse that we're studying this morning. Romans 6, 17, and it's page 981. Who wants 981? Romans 6 and 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And do you see the last clause? Uh, the, ones, the standard of teaching to which you were committed. One of the big problems in the world has arisen because of a misunderstanding about Christianity that has come from a misreading of that last clause. Most of us say, Paul, you messed it up again with your Greek grammar. Uh, you should have said, uh, this is the standard of teaching which has been committed to us. And really, most Christians have misread the verse that way. And it has really resulted in a group of Christian thinking reformers who felt that their chief responsibility was to pass on to others the teaching that had been committed to them. And so the church has bred for years finger-shaking Christian reformers who have tried to pass on to their children and to anybody who would listen the standard of teaching which had been committed to them. And so there has developed a vast group in Christendom who preach what they do not practice. And eventually, of course, this leads to politicians who claim to be speaking for law and order and do not practice law and order inside their own house. But it results in a hypocritical kind of Christendom. And brothers and sisters, the verse does not read like that at all, you see. If you look at it, uh, Paul is very clear the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And sons and daughters of God are people who are committed to a standard of teaching. Not who have had a standard of teaching committed to them to do a lot of finger shaking and a lot of didactic preaching. But they are a people who are committed to a standard of teaching. They are a people who live in a certain way, not a people who talk in a certain way. And brothers and sisters, you know it yourselves. Every time you get a group of people who live a certain way, the world wants to speak to them. And the world wants to hear them speak. But every time you get a group of Christian thinking reformers passing on a standard of teaching, you get the world putting its fingers in its ears and not wanting to hear. And I don't think we could blame it. Now, God says that we are people who are committed to a standard of teaching. What is the standard of teaching? Well, it's very clear. It's in Romans 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 and verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. That's the standard. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the standard to which we're committed. The law of the Spirit of life is expressed in the laws of the Spirit of life in the Old and New Testaments. And those are descriptions of the normal behavior of the life of the Holy Spirit. And everybody who receives the Holy Spirit into himself or herself is committed to letting the Holy Spirit live his normal life through them. And the life they will live will be the life described in the laws of the Spirit throughout the Old and New Testaments. In other words, law in the Bible, you remember we have often said, is not something that you're trying to obey. The law is there and you must try to obey it. My mum never said to me, now son, you must try to talk like an Irishman, otherwise we'll really be disappointed in you. And so I went to elocution class and uh, speech class and I tried to talk like an Irishman. No, it came naturally because I had Irish life running through my veins. So it is with the normal life to which we are committed as sons and daughters of God. We have the life of God's uncreated spirit running through our veins, and so we end up living up to the normal life that the Holy Spirit lives himself. 
And you remember that life, uh, it's described there in Exodus 20 for one place, Exodus 20, if you look at it, and verse 3, for instance, the Holy Spirit behaves a certain way, has certain actions and thoughts and words that he produces inside a human being. And this is the standard to which we are committed. And, uh, for instance, uh, Exodus 20 and verse 3, it's page 63, 63, Uh, The Holy Spirit will have no other gods before me. That's one of the marks of the Holy Spirit. And when he dwells in a person, he'll have no other gods before me. Verse 7, the Holy Spirit will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. When the Holy Spirit is present in a person, you automatically will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In uh, 8, the Holy Spirit will remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It just comes naturally to him. And when he dwells in a person, it comes naturally to that person. Verse 12, the Holy Spirit will honor your father and your mother. And that will come naturally. In 13 through 16, the Holy Spirit will not kill. He will not commit adultery. He will not steal. He will not bear false witness against your neighbor. He will not covet your neighbor's house. So really, that is the normal life of the Holy Spirit. If you look at Matthew 5 and 44, that life is elaborated, dear ones, in the inner life, page 839, 839. Matthew 5 and 44. It's uh, page 839 and verse 44 of Matthew 5. The Holy Spirit will love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He will just naturally... That's the kind of thing the Holy Spirit did when he was inside Jesus' physical body, and he doesn't change. He's part of the Godhead. He is unchanging. And so, that is the kind of life that we're committed to. The Holy Spirit will uh, believe all things, will bear all things, will endure all things. The Holy Spirit is not jealous or boastful. He is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. All 1 Corinthians 13 describes the kind of behavior that the Holy Spirit produces inside a person when he comes to live inside them. So you remember last Sunday we said that living under grace is not an arrangement whereby we are permitted to deviate from the normal life of the Holy Spirit with impunity. Living under grace means having the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit into you and to allow him to live the life of Jesus over again inside you. And really, that is the standard of teaching to which we're committed. And far from living under grace being a way out in order to be able to sin with impunity, living under grace is receiving the Holy Spirit into you and allowing him to reproduce Jesus' life. Uh, This is why Jesus and the apostles always said that the life of grace is not a freedom to break God's laws, but it's a freedom to exhibit and express those laws freely and fully in your own life. And you remember Jesus said that, we looked at it in that same chapter 5 of Matthew, Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus certainly gave no license to us to live above law or free from obeying the laws. He simply said that it would be a natural result of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us rather than an attempt of us selfishly and independently to obey them on our own. 17. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you remember Paul says the same thing really. He says uh, in Galatians 5 and 19 through 21, it's strong brothers and sisters, so I think maybe you should look at it, lest you doubt if it's there. Uh, Galatians 5 and 19 through 21, and that's page 1015. Page 1015. And Galatians 5 and 19 through 21. 
Now, the works of the flesh are plain, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. Then the strong words, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control against such there is no law. There is no law against those because the laws simply describe the life of the Holy Spirit. And so when you are letting the Holy Spirit be himself in you, you are not offending any law. In fact, brothers and sisters, the apostles go pretty far in this. They actually go so far as to say this, that if the Holy Spirit is ruling in your life, then you can't, you can't behave any other way than the way he behaves. Now really, that's, that's strong, you see. The apostles say, if you have the Holy Spirit ruling in your life and filling your whole being, then you can't behave any other way. It would be like me trying to speak with the Minnesota accent. It is something that is impossible to me. You can't do it. If you have a certain kind of life running through you, you can't behave as if a different kind of life is running through you. Now, maybe you want to see uh, at least one or two of the places where that's stated. James is one of them. James chapter 3. And that's page 1055. 1055. And James 3. Eleven through fourteen. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh water and brackish? Well, I mean, you answer it yourself. Does a spring pour forth fresh water and brackish? Uh, at the same time, it, it doesn't. Eventually, something may contaminate it and it becomes a brackish spring, but even that is unusual. Uh, can a fig tree, my brethren, yield olives or a grapevine figs? Can the Holy Spirit in you produce envy and jealousy? And obviously the meaning of the question is that the answer must be no. Really, dear ones, what, what Paul is saying in Romans 6 and 17 is that for the early Christians in the first century... Conversion was very simple. They had been slaves of sin. That's what Paul says in Romans 6 and 17. You were once slaves of sin. They had been slaves of sin. They had tried to live a life independent of God and had found themselves enslaved to making all the provisions for themselves that only God could. To be wrapped up in fulfilling their physical needs, in fulfilling their social needs, in fulfilling their psychological needs, in fulfilling their mental needs. And they were once like that. But now they have been brought out of that and they have been shown that Jesus was able to give them a supernatural life that would enable them to live free of all those things. And that all those things that they did, God condemned them for, but Jesus died for them. And so now they were to be baptized into Jesus. And they were going to be baptized into the kind of life that the Holy Spirit produced in them. So really, you know what they did with the early Christians in the first century? They would get them round, those who were going to be baptized into Jesus. And they had a book, uh, of a collection of sayings, which we have today, but isn't part of our Bible, called the Didache. And those of you who know Greek know that it means teaching. And they had a list of the teachings that Christians automatically produced in their lives as a result of the Holy Spirit. And they would instruct the converts of the teachings and they would say, all right, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, this is the kind of life he's going to live inside you. Just the same life as Jesus lived. And the converts would say, great, that is great, that's what we want. And they would be baptized the next day into Jesus, into his death, and they would begin to live that life. That's right. It was beautiful. I mean, they would just live that life because there was nothing to prevent them living it. But we are highly sophisticated now and have progressed tremendously. And so we complicate the whole business. 
and uh, we so share the difficulties of living this life with each other that we're almost psyched out before we even begin. Now, brothers and sisters, there are two places, there are two ways in which we differ from the attitude that the early Christians in the first century had. First of all, we differ from them on the height of the standard of the teaching. We differ from them on the height of the standard of the teaching. And secondly, we differ from them on the depth of the obedience that is needed. We differ in those two things. Let's look at the height of the standard of the teaching. And first I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I am not the president. No. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. The reason why I share the height of the standard with you is not so that you'll come under condemnation, but so that you would come under the spiritual principle that is stated in that verse, be it unto you according to your faith. Do you see that if you don't believe that that is the height of the standard, then that in a way paralyzes you and prevents you from ever entering into that standard? And I think a lot of us are in that position. You see. And that's why I'm sharing the height of the standard with you. Because if you don't believe that the standard is that, or that you can live such a victorious life, then you'll never believe God for it. And you'll spend your whole life crawling along the ground, making excuses and rationalizing away your partial disobedience. So that's why I share it with you. Not so that you'll come under condemnation, there's no reason why you should come under condemnation. The only reason God accepts us is because of the blood of Jesus. It's not because we live a victorious life at all. It's because of the blood of Jesus. So there's no reason for coming under condemnation. But it's so that you'll begin to believe God for the high standard of living that he has provided for us in the Holy Spirit. Now, where do we differ about the height of the standard? I don't think we differ about the quality of the standard. I think, for instance, most of us agree, you're right, brother, when the Holy Spirit came into me, he gave me a great love for people. And most of us will agree, yes, we've had some experience of a great love of people. And most of us will agree, yeah, I've felt a real patience at times with people. I have. And the Holy Spirit did. At the beginning, when I first received Jesus, I felt a, a real patience for those in my home. In other words, most of us here will agree that at times we have all felt a very high quality of love or a very high quality of peace or a very high quality of patience. Where we differ from the height of the standard is in the phrase, at times. It's the consistency of the standard that we disagree with. It's the constancy of this life of victory that we fall short of. And that's, I think, where most of us are failing to believe the high standard of teaching to which we've been committed. In other words, you know, most of us will look at a verse like Romans 6 and 14. If you look at that verse, Romans 6 and 14. It's page 981, 981, Romans 6 and 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And you remember how we talked about the Greek word used there for sin. It is the Greek word hamartia, and the article is before it, he hamartia. And when you talk about the sin, as opposed to just sins, you mean the power of Satan to incite us to rebellion and an independent attitude towards God. And most of us would agree, you're right, I am no longer a slave to the sin, to the power of sin. I'm no longer a slave to Satan's power. I am no longer dominated by Satan in my life. And most of us who are Christians would say, yes, we're at least as free as that from Satan's power. Most of us, I think, would go as far as Romans 6 and 17a there. 17a. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin. And uh, we would say, you're right. Uh, we were once slaves of sin. Now we aren't. There's no doubt. We no longer yield that unthinking, unreflective, unquestioning obedience to lust that we once did. 
And that's what a slave does. A slave yields unquestioning, unreflective, willing obedience to his master. And most of us would say, you're right. Since I became a Christian, I have stopped yielding that kind of unquestioning, unreflective obedience to lust or to pride or to envy or jealousy. In other words, when I get, dis- when I get angry or envious or jealous, I really get worried. So that's, I think, what most of us would agree with. We've at least come that far. We've ceased to be a willing, unquestioning, automatic slave to Satan. The problem is, we do these things at times. We do them at times. There are periodic uh, periods, there are periodic times of selfishness. There are carnal fits of resentment that we get into when we cry over ourselves and just hate everybody. And we do manage to pray over it after half an hour or maybe a day. Or if it's husband and wife, sometimes it takes a week. But we eventually pray over these things. But we would say that at times we come under it. Now, that, dear ones, is the difference between carnal and spiritual Christians. A carnal Christian will experience victory at times. He will experience freedom from envy at times. He will experience joy and love at times. A spiritual Christian will experience them constantly, allowing for the fact that Satan tempts and that Satan can inject feelings which you can resist and reject. Uh, A spiritual Christian finds that there's nothing coming up from within him but continual joy and peace and love. Now that's the distinction between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian. It isn't that the carnal Christian never experiences love, but it is that it is inconsistent. It is not constant. Now, uh, lest you think this is some wild old uh, Methodist heresy, I just repeat to you, um, old uh, Lenski, you remember, it's just the basic commentary that I use uh, uh, through the years, and uh, Lenski says this, Paul does not say that by committing sin while being under grace and not under law, Christians would at once change masters and adopt the sin, their former tyrannical ruler, and leave God their blessed liberator. So that's important, you see. It doesn't mean that every time a carnal Christian then sins for a while, he changes his master. No, he, he doesn't do that. Uh, He is not a slave to that master. He just at that moment chooses to obey him rather than God. These Christians want to remain under grace and God. But here's the important thing. Imagine that grace is not averse to their committing sin on occasion. And and this is a miserable old Lutheran who is supposed to believe that you sin and act in word and thought every day of your life, which obviously Lutherans do not believe. But he says this, These Christians want to remain under grace and God, but imagine that grace is not averse to their committing sin on occasion. They do not desire the old tyrant, the sin. They think, however, that they may indulge in some measure of sin. But even this is impossible. So, brothers and sisters, that's it. A carnal Christian is one who has experienced freedom from unquestioning, uh, unreflective obedience to Satan. But he is one that is still, in a sense, obeying God and obeying Satan when he chooses. In other words, a carnal Christian is still able to plead Jesus' blood. And it's guilt, you see, that makes us slaves of Satan. You do something, Satan accuses you, says you're worthless, you're useless. Now, even a carnal Christian is able to reply to Satan and say, listen, I am justified by the blood of Jesus, Romans 5 and 9. God sees the blood of his Son, and he is pleased with that blood, and he accepts me because of the presentation of Jesus' life. It's not because I'm living a flawless life. And so even a carnal Christian is able to maintain freedom from guilt and to confess his sins continually as they crop up. And so he is able to keep out of the slavery of Satan. Satan brings slavery, you see, when he's able to paralyze all motivation for good through a terrible, debilitating fear of the past and of guilt. That's how Satan enslaves you. You know, you're so born under 
the things that you've made a mess of yesterday that you haven't even the motivation to try again today. Now, even a carnal Christian can get free of that kind of slavery because he can say, no, Satan, I don't accept your accusation. I answer it with the blood of Jesus. If God is satisfied with the Son's blood, then certainly I am, and you have to be whether you want to or not. So even a carnal Christian can walk free from guilt. So they're free from Satan's slavery in that way. Here's the problem, dear ones. They have not become slaves of Jesus' Spirit. That's the difficulty. A carnal Christian who obeys God at times and obeys Satan at times is perhaps freed from being a slave of Satan. But they have not yet become a slave of the Holy Spirit. They have not yet yielded unquestioning, unreflective, absolute, automatic obedience to the Holy Spirit. So, in a sense, they live between two worlds. And really, they aren't getting the best of both worlds. They're usually getting the worst of both worlds. And the reason is, of course, what you find there, you remember in Romans 6, and uh, it was last week's verse, Romans 6 and 16. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, and there it is not hey hamartia, but just hamartia, sin, just an ordinary sin, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. You see, a carnal Christian is not a slave to the sin, to the great rebellious independent power of Satan. But when he obeys a sin, he becomes a slave to that sin. So, a carnal Christian is usually one who is freed from all sins, but just one is giving me a little trouble. And that's, that's usually the mark, you know. There is usually some besetting sin that a carnal Christian cannot get free from. Maybe it's unclean thoughts. Maybe it's a driving selfish ambition. Maybe it's a, 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 a continual failure to keep your temper. Maybe it's greed for clothes or greed for food. But a carnal Christian is one who has come free of slavery to the independent power of Satan. And they wouldn't dream of going back under that. But they are a slave to ordinary sins that keep cropping up in their lives. Now the reason, brothers and sisters, is that they in fact haven't become an unquestioning slave of the Holy Spirit. And of course Satan loves to uh, make them believe that the problem is that sin. Satan loves to get them all involved in their lust, or all involved in their selfish ambition, or all involved in their pride, and loves to persuade them, you're okay, you're okay, but just for this little thing. And this partly comes from the fact that your mother rejected her pet cat when she was a child, and you have inherited a trait from her that runs through your personality. Well, you know, that, it's bluff. It's the old bluff psychology that is not true. There is good psychology, but that's the bluff psychology. And it, really, we're always busy rationalizing and concentrating on the individual sin. Loved ones, the problem is not the individual sin. The problem is that we're between two worlds. We've ceased to be a slave of Satan, but we are not yet a slave of Jesus' Spirit. And really, that's what is needed, you know, to come into that. Uh, Romans 6 and 17, really, expresses the depth of obedience that a child of God experiences. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And a child of God who is walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit is obedient from the heart. Their life reflects constantly the laws of the Spirit, of life in Jesus, because their heart has become free. They no longer negotiate with God over commands because they realize that negotiation is not obedience. And they've given up the right to negotiate. And when the Holy Spirit tells them to get up in the morning, they get up without asking why and without negotiating with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit tells them to shut up, they shut up without asking them why. Is it reasonable to shut up? They just obey the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit says, give so much to God, they give so much without questioning they have become an automatic, willing bondservant to the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, that is the only way into freedom. And when you're a carnal Christian, 
you have a double mind, you have a divided heart. And what is needed is what Paul, you remember, talked about. He said, the Holy Spirit cleansed our hearts by faith. And what we really need is to have our hearts cleansed by faith so that we not only obey God, but we rejoice to obey Him, so that it's easy right from the inside. And really, that only comes by the Holy Spirit filling you with Himself. And what are the conditions for the Holy Spirit filling you? Well, we've talked about them so often, you know. It's interesting, you could lead into it a different way if you wanted the... The word, verse, the word used in verse 17, you see, from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That word paradokan in Greek is the same word as Pilate. It was used to describe Pilate's action with Jesus. Pilate committed Jesus to be crucified. He handed him over to be crucified. Now, children of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit are children of God who have handed themselves over to be crucified with Jesus. And that is really the first condition of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's Romans 6 and verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that's the first step. You must consider yourselves from now on dead to any ability or option or arbitrary decision to obey sin. That is not open to you. It is not an optional extra to you now. The only option you have is to be a slave of Jesus' Spirit. And you commit yourself to dying to everything else but His Spirit. So it means reckoning yourself dead to your right to negotiate. Reckoning yourself dead to your right to negotiate with the Holy Spirit. To your right at times to disobey Him. And brothers and sisters, if you say to me, Brother, can you come to that kind of decision? Yeah, you can, certainly. Man or a woman can be honest about that kind of thing. Man or a woman can come to the ground of their heart and like the early Christians in the first century can give up their right to ever disobey God. Yeah, you can. And you know, I, I know it's, I know it's uh, fashionable today to say, oh no, we're weak human beings and there are all kinds of psychological reasons. Loved ones, the early Christians didn't fiddle around with that. They weren't too concerned with the division between the person who has the Holy Spirit and the person whom the Holy Spirit has. They weren't too concerned with the person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells as a guest guest, and the person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells as host and fills completely. The early Christians knew one complete surrender and they regarded it as true that when they were baptized into Jesus' death they died to their right to disobey God and they died to their right to obey anybody but the Holy Spirit on the dot at the moment. And then you can come to that. You know, and loved ones, I do encourage you. Don't sit there and say, oh, brother, you can't come to that. I'm too complex a, a person. No, brothers and sisters, you can come to that. You can come to the ground of your heart. Will you die to your right to disobey the Holy Spirit? You really can. You can come to an honest place in your heart. Our problem is we haven't come to it because we don't like the idea too much. Well, that I think we have to deal with uh, in our own hearts. And then Romans 6 and 13, the second part. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life. And that's the daily submission, you know. That's treating him as if he is your master. Being a slave to him. Yielding him instant, unquestioning obedience every moment of the day. And really, the ones, that's the kind of life that is described, you see, in verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. And I cannot tell you the fresh breeze that blows through you inside when you are able to obey God from your heart. It's so good, you know. It's so good not to be fighting half a dozen resentments and disagreements deep down and I'm victorious but just victorious, you know, because of the big struggle I have inside. It's so good to be really free. And it is possible, really. It's possible to be free inside. Otherwise, God's Word wouldn't so often talk about obeying from the heart, you know. So I'd ask you about your own hearts, you know. How often have you looked at a friend who has done something well and you've known it was your responsibility to love him and outwardly you have loved him, but inside there's that creeping little resentment because he has done that thing well. Or how often has your roommate done something that really offended you 
And you know you're a Christian, so you're supposed to be patient, so you are patient by dint of strong willpower. But inside there's a resentment and just an anger boiling up. Now, loved ones, there's something better than that, you know. There's some life better than that. And it's the life described in Romans 6 and 17. And it's entered into by those Romans 6, 11 and Romans 6 and 13. Consider yourselves dead to sin and dead to any right to ever disobey God and any right to be anything but a slave of Jesus' Spirit. And then, day by day, submit yourselves to the Holy Spirit. Now, would you do that? Would you commit yourself to obeying the Holy Spirit without asking Him any questions? If you'd do that, you'd be into this life, really. You'd just be into it this moment. And let us pray. Holy Spirit, if there is something deep down inside us that still retains its right to negotiate with you and is still there for Lord and Master of our lives, will you show us that? Holy Spirit, if we are not yet ready to become a slave of yours, yielding unquestioning, constant, consistent obedience to you, without trying to run our own lives with your advice. Holy Spirit, will you show that to us now? We do want that kind of freedom that comes with slavery to you. And we want freedom from these feelings inside. So will you make this real to us, Holy Spirit? And enable us to die to our right to disobey you and to our right to have our own way ever for the rest of our lives. We trust you to deal with each one of us throughout the hours of this day that we may come into total, consistent, constant freedom and victory as children of God. Amen.